Marianne Glendon is next, but first, a little news for you. On Wednesday, Speaker Nancy Pelosi and Congressman Chris Smith proposed the Hong Kong Human Rights and Democracy Act of 2019 to support human rights in Hong Kong. Under consideration are annual reviews of Hong Kong's economic status and the imposition of sanctions on those who undermine its authority. Trump has called on China to end the discord peacefully and said a crackdown would make his efforts to end a trade war very hard. Some industry groups worry that the legislation could threaten the delicate trade talks. Representative Chris Smith said the bill would require the Trump administration to identify and sanction anyone responsible for human rights abuses in Hong Kong. My next guest is the former U.S. ambassador to the Vatican, the learned hand professor of law at Harvard University, and the recently appointed chair of the Commission on Unalienable Rights at the State Department. She's here to tell us about the scope of this new commission and the role of natural law in the defense of global human rights. Please welcome Marianne Clinton back to the show. Good so to see you, Great to Rand. have you back. Thanks for coming. Now, as we just mentioned, you're the head of this new Human Rights Commission at the State Department. You were appointed in July. What is the focus? What is the main goal of this commission? We have a very specific mandate. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's been a long time since any group looked systematically at the whole question of the nature of human rights, the mm -hmm. different ways in which we use the terminology and the concept. Mm -hmm. And the Secretary of State thought it would be a good idea to have a group of people step back away from the hurly-burly of daily affairs and take a look at the role of human rights in U.S. foreign policy. And that's mm -hmm. our mandate. It's a very limited mandate. Mm -hmm. We are not to make policy. Right. We are to advise the Secretary and the State mm. Department on the role of human rights. And he has specified further that our work should be grounded in the founding principles as they have evolved over time in the United States mm. and in the important commitments that the United States made after World War II. Now, now you have said in interviews that you all will consider uncontroversial rights. What does that mean? Well, uh, there's a lot of confusion about mm -hmm. fundamental human rights. Right. And uh, I think it's better to stick with the term that... Uh, is in the title of the commission. It's the Commission on Unalienable Rights, mm -hmm. which, of course, is straight out of the Declaration of Independence. A fun fact about that, by the way, is that we say uh, inalienable, inalienable today, right. and Jefferson put inalienable in the Declaration, but the printer changed it to unalienable. <laughs> to unalienable. Well. So there we are with uh, the secretary stuck to the <laughs> original term in the Declaration. But right. so um, there is a question about the scope of human mm -hmm. rights, both domestically and, and it's, is internationally. It, is it concerns that we are losing? We are so, have so expanded the scope of human rights to include things that were not initially envisioned. Is that what's driving this commission? Well, I would say that is one matter mm -hmm. that the commission will take very seriously. If everything is a right, then nothing, nothing is a, a right. 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 Um, so we'll be looking at fundamental principles. Mm -hmm. And um, where controversy comes in, you mentioned... Uh, uncontroversial. I would put it this way, that um, there are many disputes over what is or is not a right. Mm -hmm. And our commission has been directed not to enter into the realm of policy making. Uh, if a particular good or desire divides a society, then the normal way we settle those disputes in a democracy is through the people, through their elected representatives. Mm -hmm. And uh, the more we try to take things out of the realm of politics mm -hmm. by calling them fundamental rights, right. you enter into the world of winner take all. Right. Uh, that's not good for a heterogeneous society where people have to learn to live mm -hmm. together. It's very tempting. We lawyers are susceptible to the temptation to uh, have go to court yes. and, you this know... This is a human right. This is a human right. Mm -hmm. But uh, we have to live together in yeah. a heterogeneous society. And so, 
you have to understand that rights bump up against right, each other. which I want to get to in a moment. All right. Yeah. Now, uh, there has been some opposition, we have to say, to the commission. Miguel, Quite a bit. Yes. Well, Miguel Diaz, you're a, a former U.S. ambassador, your successor uh, to the Vatican under Barack Obama. He signed a letter opposing this new commission. He and others are concerned that it will quote, promote a vision of humanity that is conditional, limiting, and based on a very narrow religious perspective that is inconsistent with the beliefs and practices of billions in this country and around the world, end quote. Your response. It's really fascinating how some people seem to know what the commission is going to do before <laughs> the members have even met each other <laughs> and before it's had its first official uh, uh, meeting. Official meeting so yeah. it's, uh, it's quite remarkable. We don't know what we're going to end up with. Uh, so uh, what I think is that fair-minded people will judge us by what we produce. Mm -hmm. I think there have been many misunderstandings about the nature of this commission, but one thing that is clear is that it was constituted as an independent, nonpartisan commission that mm -hmm. is not to be an echo of previous positions of the Secretariat of State. It is not to be an echo of this administration. Mm. It, it, what is sought for is the honest opinion of a group of activists advocates and scholars. Now, the LGBT community and advocates there are worried that LGBT people will not be protected under the work of this commission. Any concern there? I don't think so. Uh, fundamental human rights belong to everybody. Mm -hmm. Man, woman, whatever persuasion they are, uh, whatever color, whatever nationality, a fundamental right belongs to human beings simply by by virtue of being human. So you're not redefining what human rights are. You're simply trying to, really, you're exposing the DNA of what constitutes a human right. Is that correct? Is that the right well, way to read this? We are certainly not redefining. And uh, I could analogize part of our task as a kind of house cleaning, tidying up. There are concepts and terminology that are unclear, very vague. And yet, here's why it's important to do it. The language of human rights has become the common discourse for international, cross-national conversations mm -hmm. about human dignity. And it's not serving its purpose of communication if we aren't sharing an understanding of what the basic mm -hmm. terms are. Mm -hmm. And is that possible? I think it is possible because it was possible in 1948. Mm. And to su the surprise of everybody, to the political realists, in 1948, the then already diverse United Nations was able to, to agree on a very few, a common core of fundamental principles. Uh -huh different foundations for different people, mm -hmm. but there are some things that are just so bad that nobody is openly going to say they're good. Right. right. And there are so many things that are so good, nobody's openly going to say they're bad. You mentioned a moment ago that there is now this clash of rights where you have religious rights competing with human rights or states' rights. Um, how do we um, disentangle that? And we're not in 1948 anymore. Right. In 1948, we at least had then, you had a more of a religious and a moral civic understanding that I dare say has collapsed in the last few decades. Absolutely right. In 1948, there was a fragile consensus mm -hmm. on those fundamental principles. And the United States had much more influence in the world than it does today. Today we're in a multipolar world. The United States is one of a few yeah, yeah. powerful countries. Mm -hmm. And there is a rival conception, a powerful rival conception of human rights that is being advanced by some powers who are disputing that original consensus, mm -hmm. China in particular. Yeah. So uh, I think that is one of the many reasons why the secretary thought that this is the moment for a group of people to get together and think mm -hmm. about the terminology, its foundations, mm -hmm. and uh, its specifically its role in American foreign policy. What are the human rights that you think have gone too far or the, the, 
the the issues or agendas that have been uh, that are now considered human rights that were not part of that original consensus. Well, somebody counted hundreds and hundreds of proposed rights. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think it's better to look at the question from the other end. Uh, where would we look to find the rights that are so basic mm -hmm. that uh, they would qualify as unalienable? And there we have, uh, in uh, the 1966 Covenant on um, Political and Civil Rights, it's very interesting. There's a list of non-derogable rights. And it's a short list. Mm. And these are rights that are so fundamental that they can't be suspended even in time of national emergency. Mm. Now, the fact that they can't be suspended doesn't mean they can't be limited. When right. you look at the Declaration, and this gets mm. to your question right. about clash of rights, right. uh, when you look at the Declaration or the Covenant, you see that uh, almost all of these rights have to, they're subject to reasonable limitations. Uh, required by respect for other rights. Mm -hmm. And so the art, and it really is an art, the art of statesmanship, the art of the lawyer consists in being able to let those apparently conflicting rights have the maximum play that each can have mm. while coexisting with each other. Mm. That's a delicate art. But uh, this impulse to have the right trump and wipe out right. the other has to be resisted. Mm. Now, uh, when I interviewed Secretary Pompeo about this new commission, he very proudly said, I was so excited that uh, Professor Glendon accepted this. You know, she taught me at Harvard. <laughs> was that part of your, was, was that at least part of the reason you accepted this, that uh, Pompeo, Mike Pompeo was... A former student? I know you've uh, had many illustrious former students. I, I, certainly that was part of the reason that I accepted that I have great respect for Secretary Pompeo and for his commitment mm -hmm. to human rights and foreign policy. Mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, an, a reason that I share with all the other members of the Commission is that uh, we all have a background in human rights activism and human rights advocacy. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, I think I speak for all of them when I say that we felt that this was an occasion where we could render a great public service, not only to the United States, but we hope to the preservation of the great human rights movement that took rise after World War II. Mm. I, I want to play this for you. This harkens back to the headline I, I shared with people before our segment. Uh, this is Congressman Michael McCall of Texas from yesterday's press conference on this proposed Hong Kong bill. I'd like your reaction. And I'd like to speak directly to the people of Hong Kong. America stands with you, and America will always support you. This is a battle between democracy versus dictatorship, liberty versus tyranny, and freedom versus oppression. Marianne, in many of the trade negotiations with China, human rights have not been on the forefront of that conversation. I am told, and it, it's being reported now, that those, those concerns have been brought to the fore. What would be your advice to this administration dealing with this uprising of democracy in Hong Kong that we're seeing? It was so touching to see so many of the protesters in Hong Kong mm -hmm. waving American flags. And I must say, it was humbling mm -hmm. to think that there's a dream of America that means so much to people outside the United States. And uh, p just speaking personally, one of my hopes for this commission would be that uh, it would help to uh, reinvigorate the notion that uh, we should be aware that we stand for something in, in our example with all its flaws, but yeah. nevertheless, a great example has been an inspiration to so many people in the world. Yeah. We can't let them down. No, no, and to be clear with that, I, I agree with you. When you saw those flags, or they were singing the national anthem, yes. some of these protesters, it's unbelievable. I mean, yes. it was truly a moment. At, when your work is done of, the, of this commission, what would you like Americans to know and the people of the world 
about this commission's work? What do you hope they'll take from it? Not only the State Department, but perhaps a wider audience. Well, it's too soon to say what the final product mm -hmm. will look like, but I can say that my hope for it is that it will be not only written for the eyes of the secretary, but for the eyes of citizens. We are not going to be addressing experts and specialists. And whatever, I, I hope we live up to the expectations of the secretary, and I hope that it will be something that will be uh, intelligible and meaningful to every one who is interested in this great cause that we all believe well, in. Well, you are always intelligible and meaningful. Ambassador Marion, thank you for being here. Thank you, Raymond. Uh, you can follow the work of uh, Professor Glendon as the chair of the Commission on Unalienable Rights in the days ahead, and we will certainly continue to cover it as the Commission's work unfolds.